Space. The great and ever-growing expanse has caught the imagination of so many creative individuals. There are beautiful nebulas, dual or triple-starred solar systems, and plenty of things yet to discover. The creators of the game Stellaris have done an incredible job of transporting this beauty into a massive grand strategy game. You can create your own race of aliens, travel the stars, colonize planets, meet aliens, go to war, or team up with other empires to take on the end game crisis. Or you can even become the end game crisis. This game is so expansive and there are so many different things to discover and enjoy. That's why I will be taking my brand new race of lithoids into this dark expanse in Iron Man mode. This mode keeps the entire game on one save, meaning that every move you make is permanent and matters. Any mistake will stick with you for the rest of your gameplay and any victory will be your badge of honor. What? what? Well, yeah, I, I, I know I don't ever revert my progress normally. I'm not lying to them. I'm just trying to make it dramatic. Look, can, can we talk about this later? We're keeping the viewers waiting. Okay, thank you. Will the Philistone and Trade Corporation prosper in the great expanse of Stellaris, or will they be erased from the annals of history? There's only one way to find out. Let's orbit around Stellaris, Rise of the Philistones. For this game, I want to try my hand at playing a lithoid race. In case you may not know much about or are new to Stellaris, Species that are under the category of lithoid are rock-based organisms. For game mechanic purposes, that means that population growth is slowed, and instead of food, our mighty philistones require minerals to stay alive. At first glance, this may not seem like a huge issue. In fact, it might even be a blessing, because our great trade corporation is fueled by minerals. There's no need to produce any food whatsoever, meaning we just freed up a ton of resources. One tiny little problem. Minerals are kind of used for everything. Minerals are an extremely important source for building, expanding, and upkeeping a myriad of different structures in your empire. You want to build a building? Great! We'll just huck some minerals at it, let it incubate for a while, and BAM! Got yourself a brand new building. Now the issue is we gotta huck even more minerals at our people in order for them to survive and incubate more Philistone people. This means per population, we're losing about one mineral per month. If you got a planet with 50 rock monsters on it, in one month they just swallowed and digested one eighth of a research lab or any tier one building for that matter. This is going to be so difficult because I get more population, I am going to lose so many more minerals and I have to figure out how to balance that and I have to, oh, if, if only there was a way that I can maybe la oh. Oh, good, good work. That, 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 that could actually, that could actually work. This was just what I needed. By giving our Philistones the radiotrophic trait, they could consume 0.5 minerals per month and 0.5 energy credits per month. That combined with the Megacorp government type means we just freed up a ton of resources. Plus, we're gonna have near infinite money anyways, because it's just how megacorps work, so I'm not even worried about energy credit consumption. I also gave them the thrifty trait to get 25% more trade value, which will produce us more energy credits just passively. The strong trait is a wonderful addition because it increases army damage and worker output. In order to have all these great traits though, I had to grab sedentary and unruly because, you know, game balance or whatever that is, but I, I don't think it'll be an issue. With all those traits in place, I flushed out the rest of the extremely important aesthetics of the Empire and made them fanatic xenophiles and materialists. The fanatic xenophile trait will help with trade value and keeping on good terms with the other empires, while the materialist ethic will help with research speed and robots once we inevitably get there. Maybe. I also grabbed franchising and free trade civics to help with our corporate and I mean humanitarian projects. Cause, Cause yes, we, we the Philistones are generous entrepreneurs, I'll, I'll have you know. And of course, every great company needs a great leader to lead us to corporate success. So I made sure to get the right Philistone for the job. Let me introduce our royal trader, Goliath. Shoot! <laughs> 
That would have been an amazing rock pun. I missed out on that opportunity. What are you doing, Jacob? With all the setup out of the way, the last thing to do was enter the Galactic Arena with our mighty sapient rock golems. The Philistones are not actually native to Philistonia, but the meteor that they were on crash landed millions of years ago, destroyed all organic life. Then they prospered, figure out how to work hyperdrive, and now they're on a mission to capit I mean help the greater galaxy. Basically, that's all in the origin that we picked. The first step of the Philistonians was, of course, discovery, which is also the first tradition tree we took. This tradition, of course, will help us explore the stars around us and increase our research potential quite a bit. We quickly capitalized on the untapped resources within our solar system and started exploring the surrounding systems. The goal for this game is to play a tall game where we focus on infrastructure in a few systems rather than owning a lot of systems. Yes, the, the goal was to play tall. I, I promise this was what I was thinking. <laughs> The reason for this is so that we can focus on branch offices, which are the main way that you play Megacorps. I'll explain more about that when it comes up, but they are an essential to any good Megacorp game. The other aspect of opening branch offices means having good relationships with different empires we encounter. So the Philistones need to have open arms for all new life forms we run across. Of course, this is so that we can give them deceptive bear hugs, stab them in the back with the branch offices we had up our sleeves to slowly siphon their resources. Get the picture? In all actuality, the branch offices help us a ton, but also help the planet that we're building said branch offices on. See, humanitarian project. Another big bonus I found out about lithoids is that they can kind of set up shop anywhere. I mean, like anywhere. These are their habability not modifiers, just for reference. Literally insane. That combined with the fact that they are literally able to inhabit tomb worlds, they can, they can go anywhere. It's also nice because we have a f quite a few habitable worlds that I plan on taking full advantage of and them being able to have 100% habitability on them is chef's kiss. We kept trucking along, exploring and expanding our reach to where the Philistones found a damaged delegate, which could come in handy or maybe be bad. It's kind of dependent on who's on the other side. They also found, in my opinion, probably the best precursor in the game. Oh, wow. Okay, so I got a really, really good one. We started with the Bowel. This incredible precursor allows us to literally terraform planets into Gaia worlds. This means more space to build on a planet, increased happiness, and increased resources from jobs. The only downside to this is that we will have to deal with organic pops, which will require food, but thankfully they have what's called the phototrophic trait, which is kind of the same as the radiotrophic trait. The only difference is that instead of minerals, they do food, but they both also have upkeep for energy, which is really nice. Since we're a megacorp and we'll have plenty of energy credits. So remember that tall game strategy I was talking about? Well, the problem was that I kept finding new systems that would make excellent choke points. And well, as you're about to see, I kind of got a little greedy. But in our expansion, we started with our first colony, the colony of Gath. And Gath is not a good name. Oh, I should try to connect them with like rock names. That would be fun. And from this point forth, we will be calling Gath the colony of Gathanite because that is kind of a rock pun, maybe. That's for the glory of our sedimentary people. <laughs> okay, I need, I need to stop. That was, that was so dumb. I need to stop. Things were going great so far. We were about to get done with our first tradition tree, our reach on the galaxy was increasing rather rapidly, and we found an incredible precursor, and thus far we hadn't run into any other galactic empires. We ran into like some mining drones, but they probably won't be an issue. It's just gonna take some time to get a fleet strong enough to contest the- Whoa! That's a 4.2k fleet?! Jeez, okay. Well, this probably means I actually need to, like, focus on my army. That's fine. Guess it's time to make more Corvettes! Here we go! With all this underway, now was the time for expansion. To spearhead this next vital and profitable venture of the Philistonian Trade Corporation, 
we needed a little boost. This boost came in the form of starting the expansion tradition tree. This tree is helpful in a myriad of ways from reducing the cost of outpost upkeep and increasing the productivity of new colonies. We also claimed our first and second choke point systems, which will help with the protection of our corporation. And we got some rockin' new tech. Rockin' new tech, that hurts my soul. Yeah, remember how I mentioned that I got a little greedy? Um, I said I'm not playing tall this game, and here I am. Or that I'm not gonna play wide this game, and here I am playing wide. But it'll be good. It's all for the good of the Philistonians. Well, let's just say our empire started eating up a lot of systems. Thankfully though, within our space, we ran into an enclave, specifically the Curator Enclave. This enclave is really good as it will help with research and help us understand Elgates. Now that we have such an important enclave that can boost us really well in the early game, I will be spending the rest of session one ignoring it entirely. Why you might ask? Gonna be real with you, chief. I kind of forgot about it and I'm only remembering it now that it is <laughs> writing the script. <laughs> yeah, I, I really need to remember to utilize this in session two for sure. Of course then, it happened. Okay, so the dimensional portal on Gath seems to be connected to a planet which looks very much like Gath. Stranger still, there's a signal being broadcast to us through it. I ran into probably the most interesting event that I had this entire session. Some of the Philistone and scientists found a dimensional portal on Gath. I mean, Gathanite. This dimensional portal seemed to link to another planet that looked exactly like Gathanite. We picked up a transmission and lo and behold, we're met face to face with another Goliath of the Philistone and Trade Corporation. Oh my word, the knowledge that we can gain from them. Who are they? What's it like in their dimension? Are the Philistonians there okay? Like what are they up to? Um, or we can trade through the por our portal. Oh, yeah, trade works too. After that, the expansion continued until we had taken the bottom system of Suth, which has a ruined megastructure, and found out we could expand all the way up to the system Aldera. We also had an election where Goliath had to step down, which kind of sucked, but it's fine. He'll he'll come back to power later, I'm sure. As we continued to expand and explore, we came across a capsule amongst some debris around Farrakad 6. The capsule seemed to be ticking away on an atomic clock that seemed pretty precise in its measurement of time. We weren't entirely convinced it wasn't a bomb, eh, so we decided to just let it be mostly because we didn't have to worry about it for another 42 years, and that is a problem for the future Philistonians, not the current ones. After sweeping that mess under the rug, we got the colony of Ijarok up and running and expanded our southern border to the system of Distol. Southern? Bottom? You know, I, I don't know how to do directions in space. The colony of Gezoid was a quick setup and we fortified our choke points by making star bases and setting up defense platforms. When we encountered a giant space orb around a black hole that I didn't even realize we had started researching, but the scientists were already doing it, so I was just like, yeah, whatever, go for it, I was a little bit shocked. In all the chaos of expansion, I had also forgotten that we were really close to uncovering the secrets of the bowel. We just needed to survey an asteroid called B9ST. With one scan, we could get a step closer to the creation of giant Gaia worlds. Then, nothing could stand in our way of... No! God, it's, I, it's you again. I Now I have to go back and make more Corvettes because my total combat score is only 1.5k, which in case you were wondering, is nowhere near 4.2k. It's fine. It's fine. I just got to keep my cool and continue with the expansion. It would be a lot easier if I didn't have to stop every five seconds to add another job for the population of a planet. Oh. The Gazoid colony is complete. Sweet. The research on the giant orb was done and we were faced with a choice. To let this very old computer continue in its calculations or we could hack it. Of course, we are the Humanitarian Philistone and Trade Corporation. We philanthropists provide and give to those in need. We are upstanding proper galactic contenders that definitely decided to try our hand at hacking it. What? It's a computerized orb that could make us money. 
What do you expect us to do? Of course, the giant computer was not a huge fan of us meddling with his calculations and asked us to please stop. So I felt a little bad and I apologized and he was all like, no need to apologize because like you already did. So I, I don't know, man, it's it's one weird little orb. Thankfully, though, we got our second Ascension perk, which was Universal Transactions. This will help reduce the cost of setting up any further branch offices, which are about to come in very handy with what's about to happen next. Any great space game has alien species to interact with, and Stellaris is no exception. Within the expansive galactic arena, there's no way that we could be alone. And thankfully for our philanthropist in the Philistone and Trade Corporation, we encountered our first alien empire. They are the interstellar Vahelet Commonwealth. Hmm, wealth you say? Tell us more. They're egalitarian xenophiles, which is a perfect combination. Not only do we have no opposing ethics, but since they have the xenophile trait, they will be much more open to receiving uh, humanitarian help in the form of branch offices. Normally to establish a branch office, you need to have a commercial pact with the other empire. Unless you're a criminal mega corporation, then you don't need any commercial pact. Thankfully, our good friends in the interstellar Vahelet Commonwealth are very eager to create not only a commercial pact with us, but also establish an embassy, research agreement, and non-aggression pact. It was glorious. The only problem is it definitely hurt my income of influence since each agreement takes so many influence points per month. With that, I found their home world and created our first of many branch offices across the empire. Phase one of our corporate, I, I mean, the humanitarian project was a success. We also set up a private research enterprise and a virtual entertainment studio. This will help us get more consumer goods and research points. It also provides benefits to the planet, which can be utilized by that empire. See, it's a humanitarian project, 50-50. Ignore the fact that we gain a lot more from it. It's fine. Now that we have an established branch office, it was time for the Philistones to embrace the mercantile tradition so that we could learn to make more profit. This tradition will increase our trade value within our empire and give us some boosts to the galactic market as well. Just in time for the beginning of our corporate takeover, we meet the Garashu Harmonious Compact. They're an authoritative pacifist empire which is interesting this is again great because none of our ethics are opposed to theirs so they are also very willing to create a commercial pact with us and you know what they say peace is good for business and as the 34th rule of acquisition states peace is good for business that's the 35th rule oh you're right what's the 34th War is good for business. It's easy to get them confused. We swiftly put a branch office in their capital world. In the branch office, we set up another private research enterprise as well as this time a public relations firm. Basically, the public relations firm just gives us unity instead of consumer goods. We celebrated such an incredible feat of capitalistic progress by finding the nearest habitable world and setting up the colony of Azakranit, a glorious addition to the Philistonian Trade Corporation. Then, the Philistonians run into a giant sun-eating being with the combat power of Death Skull, which means, well, death. I figure the best course of action, of course, is to just completely ignore it for now and let the future Philistonians deal with it later. Overall, this is an incredible start for the mighty trade corporation. They have bravely ventured off into the dark, cold embrace of space, and that darkness has been generous with its bounty. The galaxy welcomed the mighty Philistones into the galactic arena and provided them with the tools and resources to survive in this icy wild west. They faced trials, made new friends, and generously began a humanitarian project by building a multitude of branch offices to help local populations. The stars beckoned and they call out to the great Philistones. Will they be up for the call? When trials come to test their fortitude, will they emerge victorious? Will the annals of galactic history remember the name of the Philistone and Trade Corporation? Or will they erode away into the sand on the continental shores of their worlds? Only time will tell. But one thing is for sure, if they truly wish to expand and conquer the stars, the Philistones are in need of a strong, diligent leader to guide them, to support them, to imagine a brighter and more profitable future for their Silicon siblings. But where is this leader? Who will step up to the challenge? Who will determine the road going forward? Wait. Could it be?
could it be? 